Okay. Welcome everybody. Uh, welcome to the final event of our Saturday programming at the 2021 Iowa City Book Festival. Before we begin our program, I'd like to take the opportunity to thank the festival sponsors. The festival is supported by the City of Iowa City, the University of Iowa, and Iowa Public Radio. I would also like to thank the festival's partners at Iowa City Public Library, who have been wonderful hosts this week, and Prairie Lights. Um, they are selling our books at most of our events. So it is my pleasure to introduce Chewy Renteria, a b-boy since the age of 14. He's a central figure in the Iowa dance scene and is also an assistant director for diversity resources at the University of Iowa. Renteria's stories have been published in the anthology, We the Interwoven. He lives in Iowa City, Iowa. Okay. Um, Actually, I should, I should introduce the title too. So Chewie will read from and discuss his new memoir, We Heard It When We Were Young, published by the University of Iowa Press. So please help me welcome Chewie Renteria. Thank you so much, Jenny. Um, so yeah, like Jenny said, um, I uh, was born here in Iowa City. Uh, raised in West Liberty. If you don't know West Liberty, West Liberty is the first majority Hispanic town in Iowa. Um, it, have, it became majority Hispanic when I was in high school. So growing up, it wasn't I wasn't part of the majority, which is I think is a really important distinction to make. Um, so I'm going to read from from the memoir, um, and I know I don't like to tee up things too much, but I just want to give you a little bit of a backstory before I get into this first section. So. Uh, the first story in here is called Welcome to West Liberty, and it's about my relationship with my father. Uh, through kind of this, this metaphor, this symbol of this lowrider that he had. Uh, he purchased this lowrider before I was born from a man in Muscatine. Muscatine is, is a city um, on the other side. Uh, so West Liberty, you come here to Iowa City, go the other way to Muscatine. Um, roughly around the same size as Iowa City, if you aren't familiar. And he bought this lowrider from a man named Lowrider Ray. And Little Rider Ray um, got into some trouble uh, and he went to jail for a long time. And while he was in jail and while I was growing up, this Little Rider uh, kind of dilapidated in our driveway. I never saw it running in my lifetime, but I had heard stories about this Little Rider being like the first Mexican anything in our, our towns, like parades. So my dad would go and hit the hydraulic switches and make it bounce and throw candy out. So I'd hear stories about this like legendary low rider, um, but I never really saw that, right? All I saw was it rusting in the driveway. And it, to me, it kind of represented this um, gulf between my father and I, because my father and I, I don't know Spanish as well as I should. And I our cultures are like so different. I'm first generation. Um, born here. And so yeah, I'll just get into this. Um, before I started writing this story, my dad had a severe health scare. My mom took him to the same hospital I was born in, Mercy Hospital in Iowa City. He continued working at the turkey plant, now West Liberty Foods, even got a watch for his 40th anniversary at the factory. Around the same time, doctors diagnosed, diagnosed him with type 2 diabetes. My mom says it was the first time he had to go to the hospital for something we couldn't make sense of. The first time he had to face his own mortality. He's always been healthy, always been working. The doctor talked to my brother and sister, said the diabetes certainly didn't help with his condition, but it wasn't the root cause of the hospitalization. He had an issue with his pancreas. It was excruciating pain and causing him severe nausea and dizziness. As my brother tried to get all the facts straight to relay to our parents, the doctor commented, you have good English, you know? It's impressive. My brother, who has lived here all his life, snapped, fuck if I have good English or not. We're talking about my dad here. And the doctor found an excuse to leave. I arrived a few hours after this. My dad was sleeping as my mom sat beside him. She had tuned the TV on the wall to Univision, like back home. Mercy Hospital is a Catholic hospital, and next to the TV was Jesus on a crucifix. The hospital nailed the decoration up through the figure's hands. My dad stared, honey, it's chewy, said my mom. My dad opened his eyes and sat up in bed. He told me he was afraid, that he thought it was almost his time to meet God in heaven. Not yet, I told him. We sat in the room for a while. That car flashed in my mind. 
I've been bringing it up lately, asking my dad questions about it. That's how I found out he finally sold it for scrap rather than selling it to someone he knew. That's how I found out that the actual model was a 52 Chevy Fleetline. An idea rushed to me as I sat beside my dad in his hospital bed. We could find another car like that. We could work on it together. I'd been making more money. I could splurge on it. Then I thought of what my mom said to me that day Jerry and I jump-started the lowrider. One day I'd be old and I'd regret not wanting to be with them, not wanting to know him as a person. She was right. God damn it, she was right. I let the idea of a new car, the possibility of a new project to atone for my past, dissipate in the hospital room. My dad closed his eyes and fell back asleep. It was never about the car. My dad's health scare linked an immediacy to an act I've been resolving to achieve the last few years, the act of getting to know my dad. I've been hanging out with my parents more, traveling to West Liberty from my home in Iowa City and getting dinner at the same old house I grew up in Elm Street. We talk. I forced myself to mash together enough Spanglish to reiterate points I would have left by the wayside in the past. I listened to the stories my parents tell. The, the idea of this book stemmed from some of those stories, from learning about Juan and Irene, the human beings. Sometimes at night when I can't sleep, I keep myself up with the question of why I didn't connect with my parents growing up. It's a torturous question for first-generation children. Torturous because the disconnect from our parents is bigger than our parents. It's a disconnect from an entire culture, like how I don't know Spanish, like how I still can't force myself to like Norteño music. But I've been trying to connect with that culture in my own way, in ways that still feel authentic to myself. I forced my mom to teach me how to cook meals I had growing up. Gender expectations complicated this. I asked my dad to tell me something about growing up in Ohinaga. Even if it's awkward, even if it feels decades, decades too late, I'm trying. My dad is funny. One of my recent visits involved a conversation on how my parents were as babies. How fussy did their parents say they were? How long did it take them to get potty trained in comparison to my siblings and me? My dad, dead serious, declared, I was potty trained at six months. It took me a moment to register how full of it he was before my mom interjected, stop loco, he's a liar. And my dad smiled. I laughed a deep laugh, imagining my dad running around Ohinaga as a boy. There's something else that inspired these memories of the little of the low rider. And going to visit my parents more often, I ended up home by chance on the day of the county fair parade. This was the parade I had heard stories of the lowrider being in, the lone Mexican island in the sea of white small town festivities. I pulled up a lawn chair, feeling nostalgic for the parades of my childhood. I immediately noticed things were different. The whole affair was Mexican. All these Latino displays intermingled with the rest of the parade. The traditional fair was still there, yeah. The convertibles carrying the pageant queens led the pack. The floats sponsored by Mexican restaurants and stores followed. A Mexican luchador walked alongside a float advertising an upcoming lucha libre wrestling match. Floats blasted the ranchera music as they passed by. One float had a person grilling arrachera meat and passing it down to people like candy. The high school marching band proceeded afloat with local musicians playing cumbia tunes. The shriners were still there, stunting for the crowd. The clowns that brought up the rear, the ones who scared my sister so much, were gone. In their place was a huge cavalry of Mexican guys on horses. Some had their horses, horses promenade and canter. Others waited some distance and had their horses burst into a gallop for the kids. The only significant lull in the parade was when a sparsely decorated truck crept by. I noticed some younger, younger kids by me jeering before one of my tias shushed them. The Trump truck passed by in complete silence on our block. Josh Gingrich walked by with his wife and daughters after it passed. Did you see the Trump truck? He asked. Wasn't that the quietest reception you've ever seen a float get? I smiled and agreed, hugging my old friend as we laughed about the highlights of the parade, talking about how much things have changed. It's not enough to say that West Liberty is Iowa's first majority Latino town. We've read that headline so much, it's almost lost its meaning. Sure, one of the biggest hobbies West Liberty people have is to share the latest newspaper article or video about the town. I do it too. I mean, there, there have been a lot of them from the Chicago Tribune to ESPN, the New York Times, Telemundo. Each of them has done a flyby piece amounting to, hey, isn't this kind of neat, this town? There are white kids and Mexicans next to cornfields. This blonde-haired, blue-eyed 10-year-old speaks Spanish better than you. Look at all these Mexican shops, and so on and so forth. These puff, these puff pieces are hard to reconcile with the climate and animosity we felt as kids. It's tough. 
We want to celebrate and our town is more than willing to do so, but there's something else nagging at me about the changes of what Liberty had gone through since my childhood. Liberty Lanes closed down when I was in high school, replaced by Club JTs and rebranded as Flamas, a venue for bailes and quinceañeras. They filled in the bowling gutters and called it a dance floor. The shops in our downtown on our main street have changed as well. What was once only La Mexicana is now a series of Mexican shops and restaurants. Hawkeye Pizza became my tia's restaurant, Puebla. Even Jack and Jill, the little grocery store became Jeff's. If you go in the back, you'll find all sorts of carne mar marinated with homemade recipes. Mexican treats line the aisles. My nephews joke and call Jeff's jefes, which doesn't make sense because jefe means boss in Spanish, but you see what they're trying to get at. Despite these changes to the town's makeup, its ownership and embrace of our customs, there was this feeling I couldn't shake. It wasn't the Trump truck. I mean, the stories that so far prove we've been through more overt bigotry before. I didn't parse it out until I talked to an Iranian singer who told of the woes of being a touring international artist. She, something, she said something that hit me like a gut punch. She laid down this cultural concept that rushed that feeling I had during the parade into focus. We'll call it the, the three Fs, foods, festivals, and fun. When it comes to celebrating diversity or cultural appreciation, the three Fs lie in wait. It makes sense. They're a big part of who we are, of what West Liberty is. The parade had three Fs in spades, and the image of the lowrider dancing in the street is definitely part of that. But there can be this celebration before the battle is won, this patting ourselves on the back before we get to work on the deeper issues, when we are content with the puff pieces, when people think they are advocating for our town but are content with the surface level Fs. That advocacy ignores our struggles and cultural dissonance. The widening of cultures between my dad and I happened despite the embrace of some of our culture. The festivities ignore the trauma and ugliness of the kids on the playground. The food and fun ignore the internalization of things like swastikas on playground equipment. Come on, that doesn't fit the narrative here. We're trying to have fun. The lowrider group dilapidated between the parades. The weight of our own lives, the cultural strains placed upon them, all this happened between the parades. There have been less than a handful of people of color in meaningful roles in meaningful roles in the town's history, whether that means politically or socially. We still have decades to go if we ever get there. That can get lost in the celebration. The sacrifices get lost during the cultural shift from generation to generation. Those losses go unaddressed. Think of them with me when you read the headlines. When we are celebrating on the streets together, think of the car rotting in the sun. Think of the work it takes to maintain our humanity between the pomp and pageantry. Think of a father, a son, and the man who sold them a car. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I got one more, and, and then Jenny is gonna, um, kind of ask me some questions and we're gonna open it up to the audience. So um, as, as oh yeah, I should be talking to this for Zoom. Um, and people on Zoom too, like uh, uh, feel free to put some questions in the chat that we'll get to as well. But as I'm reading this next one, if you have any thoughts or questions or comments, um, you can jot them down and, and Jenny will go around and, and we'll get them for a little Q and A at the end. Um, so this next, uh, little excerpt I'm going to read is from part two of the memoir. Uh, and part two, I would say, is about uh, the relationship with my sister. And um, if you've read the book, or like Jenny's already nodding because she's read, it's like uh, my relationship with my sister has been fraught. Um, and it's funny because now we're the closest in my family because I think we actually talk. Um, but in addition to it being about my sister, it's about being bored 10 to 12 year old boys in a small town with nothing else to do. And when that happens, you turn to what we called hoodlumizing, which is a combination of uh, vandalizing and being hoodlums. Um, and this is kind of one of the most legendary uh, episodes in our hoodlumizing careers. Um, I'm trying to think if I have, I need to tee it up anymore. I don't think so, okay. Um, Oh, and this is from Fist Fights and Quinceañeras is the second story. Um, by the time I was 12 years old in 1997, I had already been through and committed more acts of violence than I dare recount. This culture of fighting was a big reason why I stuck with my friends and found refuge in our base at Ruben Chavez's garage, which we called the party shack. 
I'd argue that it's also the reason why we were getting into so much trouble in the shack. You can track our age by the severity of the trouble we got into, by how bad we lashed out at the town. At first, we stuck to egging the race car processions. We also ventured off and egged houses of people we didn't like, sure. But there was also an element of randomness. We were agents of chaos. If a house called to us and looked right for it, we targeted it. In a stroke of self-awareness, we called it hoodlumizing, a portmanteau of vandalizing and being hoodlums. After we got tired of egging houses, we looked for more creative and destructive ways to wreak havoc. With the party shack as our base of operations, we escalated our pranks and destruction to knocking down and stealing lawn decorations, messing with cars, anything we could do quick, hidden in the night. Chances are, if you lived in West Liberty and had something broken, smashed, tagged, or stolen from 1995 to 1998, it was us. I'm remorseful now in my older age. Now that I own a home and think how annoying it would be for some punk kids to come and mess with my mailbox. Josh and I recently joked that we are getting to get it, so, we are going to get it so bad in the coming years. There's going to be a cosmic re retribution, a payback of youths that tortured us like we did West Liberty. But if I can offer something of a defense, we weren't acting out of pure malice. We didn't know we were internalizing all the things we've been through in town. Well, okay, sometimes there were clear vendettas. You were unlucky to be a disliked teacher with a found out address. But for the most part, we thought we did our hoodlumizing out of this manic need for something to do, to fight the boredom that always came after we exhausted the few possibilities of things to do in town. One time, Ruben smirked at us as he dialed the number. He called the police to report some suspicious kids at the local park. We all gawked at Ruben, who was already out the door, heading the few houses over to Friendship Park. That was Ruben's modus operandi, the way he pushed us into things. As our leader, it was his responsibility to find the escalations, the way to break that persistent boredom. He was the instigator of our group. It was his job to find our limits and goad us into doing something bigger, more dangerous, and more fun. But it was the two of us who started one of our most memorable hoodlumizing endeavors. We were returning to our party track home base after a good long night of hoodlumizing. The town's coin operated laundromat was about two blocks from Ruben's house, next to the fire station north of Friendship Park. I noticed this flimsy mailbox across from the laundromat. As we ran by, I punched the mailbox and it flew completely off its stake in an explosion of plastic. The guys exclaimed at my feet, surprised that I took it off clean in one blow. They stomped the beheaded mailbox into a crumpled mess and we sprinted back to the shack. Less than a week later, a new and improved mailbox surprised us on our after-school walk to the shack. That's when we realized that the building across from the laundromat was in fact a woodworking shop. The owner took the destruction as an opportunity to engage in his livelihood. He replaced the defeated mailbox with a proper sturdy model for the shop. We took it as an affront, a challenge, a defiance to the agents of chaos and the first reprisal in a war of escalation. We returned that very weekend with a baseball bat. It took Jerry a few forceful swings to finally get the mailbox off the stake. We had to head it to the shop owner. He reinforced that thing and made it sturdy enough that it took us double the amount of time it should have taken and we waited for a response. While we waited for this regrouping, the girls at school murmured about a new kid. Did you hear? There's this new boy in our grade. He has blondish brown hair and blue eyes. Word is his parents divorced and he moved from Washington. Oh, and you can tell he works out. Our group's jealousy alarms flared. They flared even more when I saw the new kid in the flesh. He was handsome and comfortable in his movements as he navigated the hallways. It wasn't only that he worked out. It was that he had already hit his growth spurt. He was on the other side of puberty and his dad had instilled in him a work ethic that paid off in muscular dividends. He, his looks primed us to hate him. Not only that, but in my first class with the new kid, the girl swooned over his handwriting. His old school taught cursive writing. Hell, even our sixth grade teacher couldn't stop gushing over how beautiful his handwriting looked compared to our chicken scratches. I exchanged glances with my friends across the room, Eric and Josh. But when the new kid reacted to our schoolroom antics, things changed. When he laughed at Josh's and my tomfoolery after the science teacher pulled up the next in an endless parade of videos, we immediately warmed up to him. Hey, you're all right, man. What's your name? Jerry and I asked after we all got chastised by the teacher and left with the warning. You guys are super funny, man. It's Josh. Josh Magdafrau. 
Jerry and I shot each other exaggerated faces, wide-eyed and open-mouthed like the toe dancers. Wait, your name's Josh too? Jerry asked in a high pitch. I immediately thought about our Josh, Josh Gingrich, who we called White Josh. I mean, it's a common name, new Josh replied. We knew we were gonna to have to figure this one out. If this new kid was gonna become one of the gang, we'd have to differentiate to the two Joshes. After introducing the new kid to everyone, we did indeed add Magnafile to the group. We verified that he moved to West Liberty after his parents divorced. His mom started dating someone from West Liberty not too long, long after they moved from Washington, another town not quite an hour away. The thing was, this guy his mom moved in with, Josh's not yet stepdad, was a West Liberty police, police officer named Hank. Your dad's a cop? We asked Josh. He's not my dad. He's the guy my mom moved in with, but yeah, he's a cop. You're okay with that? Jerry said. With him being a cop or my mom dating him? Josh asked. Shit, I guess both, Jerry replied. Well, it's not in my control either way, he said. We agreed. That was a good point. That we added Magnafile to the group tickled Josh Gingrich. On an objective level, the handsome new kid who looked like a preppy Ken doll, whose stepdad was a cop, was much whiter than him. Without a word uttered, the official title of White Josh transferred to the new kid. Hell, Gingrich partook in calling Magnafile White Josh the most. Only, usually it was more severe. Most of the time, Gingrich would call Magnafile White Boy or the White Kid. You see, Josh Gingrich had grown up in West Liberty as the token white kid among us Mexican and Laotians. I remember an older kid named Eddie Ortiz came up to Josh at a baile, waving his arms at the crowd of, crowd of brown faces. Hey, how does it feel to finally be the fucking minority, he asked. Josh didn't skip a beat. Man, I grew up in West Liberty. I've always felt like the minority. With that, Eddie whooped out, es todo, Joshy, and went to relate to his friends what Josh said. So when Josh finally had a chance to transfer the title, however ironic and jovial it was, he relished in doing so. Magnafile, the new white Josh, laughed with the rest of us as Gingrich laid it on. Gingrich was doing just that as we walked over to the new white Josh's house for the first time. While Gingrich was joking around, Jerry, Ruben, Eric, and I, the actual non-white people, were apprehensive. We weren't sure what to make of the fact that white Josh's mom's boyfriend was a town cop. Our last hermitizing adventure flashed in my mind. Would this kid knock us out? Magnify didn't live too far from Gingrich's house. We popped in and he introduced, introduced us to his mom. She was nice and seemed excited that her Josh was already making friends, making him blush in response. Josh showed us his Nintendo 64, which was sweet because it had come out the year before and none of us had, could afford one. Then the loud sound of boots reverberated off the kitchen floor. Magnafile continued playing Super Mario 64 while the rest of us froze, nervous for the interaction. What if Hank somehow recognized us from one of our hoodlumizing escapades? What if he made out the bright streak in Jerry's hair in the moonlight while we were running away one night? Hank gave away his presence before he entered the side room we were in. Josh, you've got to take out the... He called. Then he stopped as he entered. He was in full police uniform, which surprised me for some reason. Maybe I thought he'd change out of his work clothes at the station. Oh, well, look at you. I didn't realize you already made little friends, little girlfriends. The trash? I'll take it the trash before dinner, Magnafile said, not looking up from the game. And you'll take it out with a smile on your face, Hank said, half joking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hank gripped his utility belt as if he were about to hoist it up. He smiled at us. Ladies, he said before making an about face back to the kitchen. Under his breath, eyes still on the television, Magnafile uttered out a single word. Pig. Gingrich grinned. Hey Josh, you ever heard of you ever heard of hildebizing? And I'm, uh, I I want to finish up, so I'm I'm going to skip ahead a little bit just to get to this last little section. Um, so let me make sure I have the right thing here. So we knocked out the mailbox. And the woodworking guy built a, a replacement and we knocked that one out. And then all of a sudden we go and that we see what I describe as Frankenstein's monster of a mailbox. It was this like reinforced steel thing that looked like um, it, it, something out of like a, I don't know, like a, like a gothic horror film. Um, and so we, we made a plan to take it out. And, and this is the night of that plan. Um, Finally, the sun set 
and the roar of the races filled the night. We scraped open the party shack's door and cascaded into Ruben's backyard. Ruben and I had developed rudimentary hand signals for the group, things like follow me or scatter, basic communication we needed to convey in silence. We felt like operatives in the field. It didn't take long to get to the woodworking shop. Ruben, Zane, oh, and I should mention that uh, we figured out the difference, the two Joshes, we had to figure out uh, which one, like we couldn't keep on calling them both Josh. So Josh became Zane, which he told us was his name that his dad called him. So Josh Magdafrau, new kid. Ruben, Zane, and I led the way. Jerry and Eric followed, watching our backs. Josh, Josh Gingrich, old white Josh, brought up the weir. It's 1028, Eric said, looking at his watch. He was the designated timekeeper. We huddled together, darting glances in all directions for potential headlights. Okay, everyone, bust out your shit, Ruben said. We unsheathed various tools and weapons. Jerry and Josh had screwdrivers and wrenches in different sizes. Ruben and I had the baseball bats. Eric had a crowbar. Jerry, Josh, you know what to do, Ruben said as he made way for the two to get at the mailbox. We hadn't had a chance to look at the type and size of screws on the mailbox during the day. The plan was to see if we could assess that and take them off all at once. Jerry and Josh worked in tandem, cycling through tools. They whispered expletives as they worked. Dude, none of these will work, Josh said in desperation. We have to try them all before we make too much noise, I replied. 10.35, Eric said from the side, one hand on his watch. This was a repeat of the last time we tried to take out the mailbox, before we were able to knock it off with Ruben's metal bat. That ended with loud clangs that reverberated in the night, clangs that made your hand vibrate and sting. But that was the last mailbox, though. This new and improved model would take a Herculean amount of effort and noise to bash. The weapons were the last resort. We waited as Josh and Jerry continued to fumble with their tools. Come on, come on, someone said, not realizing that they were saying out loud. A loud clang shot out from the group where the guys were working. Oh, shit, Jerry whisper yelled. They had dropped one of the wrenches in their haste, and they had fallen onto the other tools, metal on metal. A dog began to bark a few hosses down. Damn, 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 Jerry continued. 10.40, yo, we gotta go to the next phase, Eric pleaded. Ruben looked over at me for confirmation. This was taking too long. We had to resort to bashing this thing and hoping we could get it off like last time. Damn, okay, Eric, hand me the crowbar. Chewy, fuck the wooden bat. Go straight for the heavy duty one. I nodded and exchanged my wooden bat for Ruben's newer and more expensive metal one. We patted Jerry and Josh on their shoulders, indicating that they should gather their tools and be on the lookout. I swung first, a big, marvelous swing with all my mights. A metallic crack echoed, a call and response from the laundromat across the street. We looked on in desperation. There wasn't even the slightest ding on that cursed mailbox. Ruben tried next with a walking lead-in. Ruben was always stronger than me. Besides his wrestling training in the winter, he played baseball in the summer. The mechanics of his swing were perfect as his crowbar clanged against metal. Ruben shook the sting off his hands as we again marveled at the pristine mailbox taunting us. 10.45, Eric said, desperation squeaking through his voice. It's now or never, guys. My ears were ringing from our strikes against the mailbox. Another dog joined in with the first barking and howling at the, at the racket we were making. For all our talk and planning, our mission was looking to be a failure. In the distance, across from the railroad tracks, I saw a pair of growing yellow dots, headlights coming our way. Now or never. We jumped into old hyperdrive, trying to beat the snot out of that mailbox. We took turns over each other, like what I imagine two railroad workers hammering down a spike would look like. All semblance of a plan of attempt to be quiet were gone. We crashed down on that mailbox with a fury. Out of breath and panicking, I almost cried when that mailbox stood before us, intact and immaculate. Yo, yo, we gotta call it, man. That car's heading that this way, Eric said. He was already starting to shimmy away from us and the mailbox. Sure enough, the once small headlights merged together and were getting closer. They were almost to the post office, which was only about 50 feet or so from the railroad tracks. If it was a cop and they crossed those tracks, we'd have to abort. I watched Ruben for the scatter hand sign, moments from giving it myself. What should we do, Jerry and Josh said, tools spilling out from their arms. Then, over all the commotion, came another noise, a dinging. A red light flashed on the horizon. Eric squealed and took a couple more steps away from us. A flash of panic struck the group. We all thought the light came from a, from a cop car, but there wasn't any blue mixed with the red. It was the lights from the railroad crossing. The dings accompanied the barriers that came down. That halted the headlights before the track. The wail of an incoming train followed. It's a train! I yelled over to Eric, motioning for him to come back. 
The trains running through West Liberty could last a few seconds or a few minutes, but it could have been a whole hour and it wouldn't have mattered. We had made zero progress on taking out the mailbox. The train roared in our ears. We couldn't hear each other. I let my, I let my back go limp as I watched Ruben renew his attack on the mailbox. The train was so loud I couldn't hear the blows of his crowbar or his screaming curses. This was it. The mailbox had bested us. In the fury, I contorted my hands into a scatter sign and went to turn to the group. Then I felt a hand on my shoulder. I watched in awe as Zane signaled to Ruben to back up. I'll never forget the image of what happened next. Zane stooped under the mailbox like he was going to give the post a bear hug. The mailbox was so tall that it came up right above his shoulder. With the train thundering past as a backdrop, Zane heaved and shuddered. He did that thing that happens to weightlifters when they're trying to break a world record. His muscles shook and convulsed as he attempted to rip the mailbox post from the very ground. Our entire group watched, slack-jawed. We could see, but not hear, that Zane was yelling through gritted teeth. Our mouths opened wider as the post began to jerk loose from the soil. By the time the train passed, Zane had finished yelling. It was, as, it was as if the two noises were one. He had done it. He had pulled the post right out of the ground like he was a giant. The dinghy on the railroad crossing subsided as Zane, Zane stood before us with the mailbox post above his head in his arms, smiling like he had done the impossible. Scatter, I yelled as Reuben and I helped Zane carry the post. It took the whole three of us to carry it the whole way. We whooped and laughed in the night. When we got to the party shack, we took turns lifting that behemoth of a mailbox passed over our heads. Every few minutes, we break out into chants of Zane, 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 some of us more enthusiastic than others. Josh Greenish joined in on the chants, but I could see that he did so with less enthusiasm. In the woodworking shop, they never did construct a new, new mailbox. They probably got a P.O. box after that. Thank you. It's so sad. It's like they still don't have one. <laughs> I, hope, I hope whoever it is isn't too pissed at me for that. Well, Chewy, my questions are um, they have the theme of I'm, I'm interested in, in kind of your, your creative process. And so I, I like that. That seems that um, the mailbox. Thing seems like maybe part of an of an evolution of this is you know, this is your first anarchistic art piece. <laughs> um, yeah, so I I'm so I grew up in Tucson, Arizona, um, and I'm thinking of it kind of as like a, a reverse of, of of West Liberty a little bit. Like the Latinx culture um, had very strong foothold and, and presence there. Tucson is, is kind of a uh, very close to the border. Um, and, you know, I grew up knowing what quinceañeras were, and I was a white girl who danced folklorico. We need to have a conversation yeah, about that sometime. No, that's amazing, yeah. <laughs> um, but so the image that that really struck me um, at the beginning of your book was, was of your dad's like low rider um, in the in the the initial like Mesquitean parade as you saw it or as you remember it as a child. Um, that it's kind of trailing by itself, you know, after all the farm equipment, after the shiners and the beauty queens with the big, the big blonde hair. Um, and, you know, I was struck that image was so, so poignant. And then, and then the fact that it ends up, you know, sitting, you know, rusted in the, in the garage, but it's, um, but, but also there's also, there's a lot of pride in that, in mm -hmm. that image too. So it's, it's not completely sad. Um, but, um, but my, I, what I'm interested in is, you know, how did, or did being somebody who's, you know, you, your cultural heritage was so, so freshly planted and, um, in West Liberty, I said that in this, it was in the sixties that, um, there was a, the flyers were sent from the meatpacking factories into the border towns of Mexico to get, um, to get people to come to these to these jobs, so that's when that that culture started developing. Um, so you know, just being somebody who has that that dissonance that you talk about of of growing up in a in a very white white community with the, the Mexican heritage and um, some 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 Latinx writers that I've read talk about how 
this dissonance is a kind of a kind of fuel. It's like a living on the border, a creative fuel for them. And I was wondering if that is at all true. You know? Yeah. No. No. That's a really good question because it's it's um it's never cut and dry, and I, and I think that comes through in the memoir, like over and over again. That um kind of what I think a lot of people's expectations are of my family, of myself, of my town, they get subverted over and over again. Like if you think you know, and one of the big things is this idea of, because in the beginning it starts with like really over like instances of racism that I experienced, but it's also like West Liberty, I think is one of the most welcoming diverse towns that I know of, right? So it's like that same kind of dichotomy of, of that being the same town. Um, and I think that it's almost, um, it's like kinetic. It's like the idea of like energy and creative energy coming from, from friction. Um, and this idea that like, you, you, we knew more than anybody else that like human beings are extremely complex and like the social interactions of like the, I mean the the whole idea of the parade in the Trump truck coming through right like we like that was a a kinesthetic kind of response right that that was a response that we felt in our bones rather than something like manifested in social media right man if like the way I think a lot of people interface in terms of like politics is through like the this kind of there's a divide um and for West Liberty, in the way I think the way the to put the pin on it is like you have to look people in the face, right? You have to actually interact with them in this way, which I think a can make things really tricky and make lots of conflict, but make lots of celebration, but then also make lots of like you're saying, it's like this creative urge. And I think it's I don't think it's a coincidence that West Liberty has so many creative people come through uh, out of it, you know, and not just Mexicans, like you know anybody that comes through like there's a good chance that like people are, are are they want to create something because i think they've come through this like microcosm of you know the country and the world and this kind of like this th these interactions that that force you to think of things in a different way mm -hmm. that's really yeah that's that's really interesting um yeah yeah and, and my other question feeds into that as well you know i i do think that um th the art and creativity thrive in um, multicultural and interdisciplinary um, in environments. Um, and, you know, I, so I was fascinated with the, the, the break dancing <laughs> in, in your book and, and also the fact that that was, um, that the Laotians <laughs> were the ones who introduced you to, to break dancing. Um, yeah, and I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about, about your journey towards becoming a writer and how those other things influenced it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the, the third story, so what Jenny is referring to, the third story is called Lessons in Beboing. So it's like, um, and and we, we had to edit it out because like, I mean, that story was humongous. Like it was, it was a bear because like I was trying to get so many things out. But there used to be a passage in here where, where I said, uh, would you believe me if I said that in, uh, in 1999, there was more dancers in Southeast Iowa um, than you could count, something like, I think we try to put a figure at maybe like 300 dancers between Iowa City, Muscatine, Davenport, Columbus Junction, like all of these towns. And it was this huge scene. And uh, and, and I talk about in the book, I, I would postulate that it's because of our access to uh, like personal computers. So our families, so, you know, I grew up just to like, you know, just to get it out here, I, I grew up like lower class, right? Like a lower income. And when it became, when like those big compact computers were affordable enough for families like mine and, you know, the, the Laotians in the trailer park, we had access to this whole world that we didn't have before. And so I think that's why in 99, 98, 99, you see like things like breaking kind of explode. And the other piece which you alluded to as well was that the Laotians would have like family out in the coasts. And I said, uh, I say something like, uh, like breaking in West Liberty happened, like other things happen for us, other fads and trends happen in the town. It's like uh, either the Laotians or the Mexicans getting it from their cousins in the coast and bringing it to the Midwest, right? Um, and it, again, like, like in my second, in my first answer, it's, it, it's this, um, 
I don't want to say flash in the pan because it's, I think it's still happening. Maybe not necessarily with breaking because like since then, like, you know, like I and one other of my friends are like the only two people of that generation, you know, because breaking is such a hard dance and like generations come like in four years. But like I go and do like workshops in Liberty or talk to kids and like you could tell that they have, they have their finger on the pulse of something, right? They have their finger on the pulse of like what, what like, this creativity is like th these juices and um the way that it, it it worked for me in terms of like my dance and my writing is um uh carol clark who is uh was my high school teacher which i i i, I give the acknowledgement to her and she's right there um she helped me uh um because i always loved writing as well as dance and i remember in high school right when i graduated uh there was a writing camp and i was terrified to apply for it it was with the uh it was the iowa youth writers project it was like alumni from the writers workshop doing a, a camp um like at birch hall and i was so terrified and carol like you basically pushed me you're just like you should just do it just, and i applied the last day and i got in um and it was super validating and and then I think I did that and I've, I've told the story a couple of times when I do sessions so I apologize if you heard it but um I did that thing that young people do where they think they have to choose and I thought I had to choose between dancing and writing and the thing is writing is so difficult and it can be lonely and it's it's just like it's this kind of you have to grapple with your identity more whereas dance can be very like you can actually manifest that 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 that, that kind of torment through the dance, right? Like if you're having a bad day, you can be like, I'm gonna dance, right? Like if you're having a great day, whereas writing, I think it, it takes a little bit more discipline. Um, so then I told myself, I was like, man, I'm like dancing every day, but I haven't written in a week, I haven't written in a month, I haven't written in a year, blah, 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 you know? So it took me a long time. And that's one of the things when I talked to kids, when I talked to like junior high and high school kids, I was like, you can do more than one thing. Like you can figure it out, it's okay. You know, like don't let one of your passions push out another one's your passions just because you think that you have to focus on one thing, especially now with the way it works with the internet being what it is, what it, grow, what it has grown into. I think kids today are especially are even more like they, they're such like they put on different hats every day. Right. So, yeah. So I finally got to a point where I'm like, I can write the way that I can dance. Right. I can write in that if, if my day is going really well or my day is going really bad, it's my mom. Hey, it's my mom and dad. <laughs> um, hey, late, you're late. I'm just joking, sir. Sorry. <laughs> they said that they're going to come to a reading we're doing in West Liberty, so, so no, 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 no. Oh, don't, don't, I don't mean to make them feel Great bad, surprise. um, yeah. but yeah, no, just to put a pin on it, I, I mean, I think, um, I, I, I love dancing and I love writing and I'm at a point now where I can do both and feel fulfilled by both in, in, in very different ways, yeah. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah, it, I mean, and your and your the writing itself does have this kind of kinetic energy that um yeah, I think that you the dance it's benefited from your mm -hmm. from your mm -hmm. dancing and, and make sense for them. Um yeah, I'll I I also find that you know when I write all the tension builds up 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 in my body and I have to move. So I think having dancing <laughs> as a complementary art form would really, would really help. Um, yeah. So, and then my last question is, you know, Iowa City is, you know, kind of becoming a big sort of hub for, um, for, for the arts, um, you know, or there, there's a big, a big push to establish ourselves that way. Um, but then, you know, we're thinking of these surrounding communities like West Liberty, where you're talking about there's there's these really vibrant kind of um, uh, pockets of creativity. Um, you know, so how how do we incorporate that? You know, how as a, at a, as a city who has resources, you know, for the arts, do we draw those people in? Yeah, no, that's a great question. And that's a that's a great question because I think it's such a it's such a tricky tightrope. Um and, and and I talk a lot about I talk about it without talking about it, but like the idea of like politics, right? The idea of of like this political spectrum and, and how you 
how where you are in that spectrum um, can shade how you feel about you know immigration, how you feel about you know like undocumented citizens, how you feel about you know first generation and, and language, you know like. Um, but a tricky thing about Iowa City and something I I, I don't know if I actually if it's in the book or not, um, but, it, but it, might, it might as well be, but it's like Iowa City is such a like a liberal town. And one of the, the pitfalls of being such a liberal progressive town is that it, it, it kind of reminds me of like the horseshoe, right? Like if you, if the stereotypical, like, you know, the, the very conservative thing is like, we regard these immigrant, immigrant populations as a statistic, as a number, as like, oh, like these people, blah, blah, blah. Um, I think it also with like Iowa City, you can try, they can try to be, um so kind of how i alluded to with the with the, the three f's the food festivals and fun right you you want to champion this group so much and then you're able to pat yourself on that on your back without really being like hey we're we're fucking human you know like we're, we're human beings instead of being like oh like what's liberty it's a 52 percent hispanic now as opposed to 10 years ago when it was 40 blah blah blah. and it's just like those numbers don't matter right what matters is that you're actually looking at us as peers as people who have something to contribute right um so when it comes to like art looking at west liberty looking at columbus junction looking at all these other towns that and i mean not even towns that have these big like hispanic populations or you know populations with with uh you know refugee populations or things like that like just the other towns too like the wilsons the west branches as well um giving them funding giving them uh respect giving them a platform giving them um avenues to communicate like how many times has people have people from groups from iowa city um talked on behalf of towns like Wissabri, have talked on behalf of towns that surround them that are in Johnson County, but they don't really matter because they're, we're an island of blue and a sea of red. Like, what does that really mean when it comes to actually um, letting people fall through the cracks, especially from a creative place, you know? So, I mean, I, I think it takes lots of work and it takes work that we need to catch up to in terms of like, you, we can't just like have it be done in a day. We're like, oh yeah, let's go and, and, and reach out to these people because I think it also becomes this issue of um, West Liberty has done fine, fine without Iowa City, right? Like, so if, you, if you're gonna try to extend this bridge or this connecting kind of like path, um, you have to be very careful about being like the savior, right? Like, like these people from Iowa City, I, and it, it happens for me as well, right? When I, every time I go and do a workshop in like in, in my high school or whatever, I have to like check myself before I go in. I'm like, these kids already know so much. I'm not, I'm not their savior. I'm not the one that's going to show them the way, right? So yeah, yeah. so mm -hmm. I could talk about that forever. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Great. All right. Well, I think we'll go ahead and get onto the Q and A portion. Um, so we have a microphone. If people have questions here in the room, we did have a couple of questions that came across on the Zoom from folks that are watching there. Um, so, excuse me. The first question is, and this might be odd with family members sitting right in front of you, but how did your family members and close friends react to their portrayals in your book, and how concerned were you about any backlash? <laughs> That's hilarious. I just had a, a phone call with my mom and my dad uh, and my sister about that. <laughs> Um, and it's, it's funny too, like I mentioned before, I think one, one of the, um, the, the, the most like intense portrayals is the relationship with my sister in this. And she was the one that I talked to while I was writing it, who, if you read the book, if you know anything about it, you, you, you this would be like, kind of, I think this could be a surprising fact that my sister is the one that championed getting to the truth of it more than anybody else, which was, I think. I mean, amazing because like there's stuff in here that maybe she could be like, oh, this is, you know, I'm not portrayed in the best um, way. But the thing that I tell people is that like, I'm trying to get to the reality of a situation and the reality of us. And I think people who, 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 who trust that I'm not trying to air our dirty laundry or I'm not trying to just like, it, nothing in here is just for the sake of, of um, like, you know, sensationalist or gossip. It's all there because I'm showing that we're real people. Um, and it is hard. 
and I have, I'm at a point where I, 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 I knew it was coming and I'm like, I, I made a decision to ask for forgiveness rather than permission for some of this stuff. Um, because, and I was talking to Jenny before this, cause I, I think if I asked for permission, it would just be like grinding to a halt this process. You, every, every, um, step would be me second guessing whether this is the right thing to say, because what if somebody takes it out of context or what if somebody, I think the hardest thing isn't the people who read the book, it's people who have heard the stories in the book from others that have read it and jumped to like the worst po possible scenario of it. So uh, yeah, I'm still navigating it. We're still navigating with it. <laughs> I think the people who read it, I think they understand that we're human. And, you know, this, a lot of it happened in the past and a lot of it is, it, we're still working through it, but I think people appreciate that I, I do put it out there. I do say that we're, we're, we're flawed and we're like amazing and, and we're scared and we're the, we're the, um, the consequence of our society in a lot of ways, right? Rather than saying that we're, we're just plain victims or we're just plain per perpetrators, we're, we're, this, everything in all of the above, right? That said, do you still get a little nervous when you see certain numbers pop up on your phone? Oh yeah, of course. Yeah, I'm waiting. I'm, I have some like Facebook. I'm like, oh fuck, when this person's <laughs> gonna get me, or like the the people who who want to know because I change some names, you know. And there's the, obviously there's you know there's some. I I mean every time there's an instance of of some interaction in there, it was me thinking like. Am I being responsible about this? Am I am I just thinking about um, is it does it serve the greater good of of what the story I'm trying to tell? Um, and I the uh, one of the trickiest things so far is people being like, who is that really? Because like you know they can kind of get a sense of it, and I intentionally kind of like melded people and stuff like that. So it's just kind of like doesn't matter who it is. What matters is the story, man. So yeah, no, there's some names that are coming up that I'm like. Yeah, yeah, we'll have right. a conversation. <laughs> do we have any questions from anyone here in the room? I do have another one on Zoom if you want a little bit more time to think. We do have a few more minutes. Um, so, Joey, uh, somebody asks, I wondered if you see part of your writing work as preserving the rich cultural history of West Liberty as opposed to the flyover media impression that you noted. Yes, yes. And um, it's been a really uh, interesting journey with that and, and that kind of piece. Um, at first, I think I was even trying to make it more of a, of a, of this kind of objective, um, like anthropological historical take. I, I wanted to like interview like all the different people and see if I can talk to the family that came, um, early, like even earlier than the, 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 all the families that immigrated in the sixties because of the plant, they came because of the railroad and it quickly became like, I think that was maybe a project for another day or maybe a project that is just too big for me because um, even just getting my family story is really hard, right? But like getting this, story, I mean, that's, it's trauma. It's like generational trauma. So like trying to get that, I, I think it's, you you might need a whole team to get it, right? And it became this thing where in in the course of this book, it became deeply personal. And and I realized that I had to make a decision whether I wanted it to, to be this kind of really big exploration of those personal issues in my life rather than this more like um zoomed out perspective i also i also knew that there was also uh me and I, I think it still happens like dashing people's expectations of what should be included right it's like this almost like um like howard zinn like kind of radical history right because people want oh, like and this library has some amazing history too like that that it deserves to be in there um you know, like John Brown came through, like it has like underground railroad, like I think, Carol, you said that there was like his, his sword. yeah, his sword is like in West Liberty, so John Brown, yeah. So it's like all of this stuff in it. And then, but is that more important than these untold stories of, of these like generations of, of immigrants um, that, would be so much harder to document and so not that not, not just document to to unearth and to get out and it's kind of like same way that I kind of work with with our, my own personal history it's like it's so hard to get uh when you don't have primary sources when you don't have actual stuff that's like digitized is then it becomes like okay what what's real what's what actually is the history here so yeah no no but yeah I think it is this this also I think 
using our story and my story as the springboard where other people can relate. And I think there's that universality in, in, in terms of not only Mexican, but like first generation families, like that cultural uh, push and pull is like, you talk to anybody, it doesn't matter if they're like Filipino or, you know, like, um, like, you know, like Japanese, like they have that struggle. So I think that's something that I also kind of think about a lot. You know, one question from here in the room, and this will be our final question. So thank you. Sorry, I talked a lot. been featured on NPR twice is bilingual, um, and people are waiting in line to even be admitted into the school. So uh, I think that happened probably maybe, I don't know when exactly, but I've had a lot of experience with West Liberty with my work. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I just think it's a wonderful, wonderful city because it's it's all just kind of built around the people there that believe so much in in the uh, in the area. So, what do you think about the bilingual school? It, it's it's ultimately, I think it's amazing, right? I think I think it's a it's a great asset. It's it was the first one. Um, it's a it's a dual language immersion program for the people who don't know. Uh, the first of its kind in the state. Um, it happened when I was in high school, I think maybe like 2001 is when it started, um, which I like, you know, for me, like, I think I would have loved it. Um, but like, much like a lot of other things in this book, it gets very complicated very fast. Um, and it gets kind of, uh, there, there's the, the general idea of it being a positive thing. And then there's the reality where it can get, um, it can can show some of the, the 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 really complicated nature of doing a program like that. Real quick example, um, it's hard. It's really hard. Like think of, like, I forget what grade they started at, but like it, you have to, as a kid, think about like, you're literally taking your entire course, course load in English and then Spanish. And something that the pandemic really kind of put to, to, to the forefront and kind of, you know, the same way lots of other, um, like systemic uh, uh, like injustices have come to the forefront um, because of, of, of COVID. Uh, something as simple as um, if people are trying to do dual language in, in times of social distance learning, who are the kids that are able to afford to have tutors or extra you know, curriculum outside of school? It's the white kids. Right. Who are the kids who are ultimately dropping out? It's the Mexican, it's the Central American kids. Right. And then so now I think that's a really tricky, like, you, you, they, like, it's not, it's not enough that with Sabrina can be like, we have this program. It's an, it, you have to go like, oh, we have this program. And it's also showcasing all these really difficult conversations we have to have. And we have to make sure that we are, are, are constantly adjusting. Because if we don't, the nature of this society makes it so we lose kind of the spirit of it right so yeah but no ultimately it's amazing too so i don't want to get to <laughs> that's this book in a nutshell yeah <laughs> all right great well thank you very much that brings us to uh, the end of our time uh, i would like to thank jenny colville from uh, the wonderful new iowa city literary nonprofit porchlight for being our moderator today so thank you very much jenny and uh, thank you to chewy for uh, coming and, and reading from his book and talking with us please help me thank both of them So we do have one more program uh, here in the room. Uh, I will be interviewing uh, Roxanne Dunbar-Ortiz about her book, Not a Nation of Immigrants. Uh, she will be appearing on screen uh, virtually with us, but if you'd like to uh, stick around and see that, you can. And for our folks on our Zoom audience, there's a separate Zoom link that you can find at iowacitybookfestival.org for that one. Again, that's at four o'clock. Uh, I'm sure that Troy would love to uh, meet with you and sign books. I want to ask him to go out to the table uh, with the folks from Prairie Lights, and they would be happy to sell you a copy of his book. Uh, that way we can get the room turned over for our next event. So thank you again for coming. I hope you'll stick around. And uh, thanks again to Ian Jenny. Yeah, thanks,